Coach Bill Hartman uh, often said uh, uh, you were his favorite player. He really, well, he really complimented you on your versatility. You played running back, you played fullback, played blocking back. You could play all the positions in the old single wing offense, and you could back up the line on defense. That's a pretty heady compliment. How does that make you feel? Um, Coach Hartman was nice to say that. I think that. Uh, that he would say that because uh, he he had such a coaching job to do with me. Uh, see, I'd played high school football and, and I literally had not been coached at all. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, the coach, uh, called a meeting the first first day of practice and he said what was your offense last year and i got up and designed a couple of plays for him to show him what our offense was the year before and he said that's our offense this year and that's about all he knew and i don't remember being coached at all by him or the previous coach and when I was a sophomore, I didn't play very much, but the coach knew a little bit. He had played in the line at Oglethorpe University, and he knew something about line play, but I don't think he knew much about backfield play. Anyhow, I don't remember being coached, but I didn't play much that year. More about Coach Butts. You talked about him earlier in the conversation we were having, but uh, uh, what were his qualities as a football coach that you appreciated? Uh, he, coach Butts insisted that you do the right thing all the time. Uh, and of course, uh, he believed in hard work and he believed in uh, scrimmaging football players and, and we scrimmaged that first spring practice that really started January the 3rd and went to the 25th day of May. And, uh, and if I remember correctly, we had a scrimmage every day in that practice, including the first day of practice. We'd go out and take two or three side straddle hops and, and start scrimmaging. Uh, I went from the University of Georgia into the Army infantry and the, the ground troops in the infantry. And I was in action on Attu, Kwajalein Island, Okinawa, and, and uh, Leyte. And uh, I will say this, Coach Butts worked us harder than I ever worked in the Army. And uh, except for the, f the only, the big difference was you didn't get shot at in, in Sanford Stadium. You got shot at in, uh, in, Jap in the Japanese folk realm. And anyhow, the Coach Butts made the Army easy for me. It was a lot easier for me than playing football for Coach Butts. Charlie Trippy, you didn't play with him. He was a freshman your senior year. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see, you saw Charlie play. What kind of player was he from your perspective? Uh, well, Charlie and Frank Sinkwich were the two greatest football players I ever s played with or maybe ever saw. Uh, they were, you cannot compare them because they were such different athletes. Frank hurt you when you tried to tackle him. You could tackle him, but it hurt you, and you didn't want to tackle him the second time. Trippy, nobody could ever catch. He not only was elusive, but he was fast. And I honestly, I didn't, uh, when I was a senior and, Frank and Charlie was down here, uh, as a freshman, I don't remember 
scrimmaging much against the freshmen at that time. We had plenty of folks on the varsity we could scrimmage against, but I don't ever remember trying to tackle Charlie Trippy. I know that I never did tackle him. If he, if I scrimmaged against him, he either outran me or dodged me, and I never tackled him at all. A Georgia boy growing up in Georgia and playing for the University of Georgia, how do you evaluate that experience looking back? Well, uh, you know, that first spring practice, a lot of my freshman classmates quit, and a lot of the recruits quit. Some of them quit almost every day. And I can't say that I didn't consider it, but I couldn't go back to Cornelia, Georgia, and say I'd quit. I just couldn't do it. And I'm glad I didn't. What does it mean to you to be a Georgia Bulldog? Well, it means a lot. Uh, I have a next door neighbor who went to Tech. His wife went to Georgia. They have a fuss. I would get to referee the fuss every, every time they have the fuss. Uh, it's, it's uh, well, I've had the same tickets since I came back here from Kansas. Four tickets that I've purchased every year since 19, I reckon, uh, 1953. You also knew Ty Cobb. One final question. Uh, any special memories of the great baseball player? Well, Ty was an enigma. He was, I liked him. And he had some outstanding qualities, I thought, that nobody ever knew about. He didn't want anybody to know about. He wanted folks to think of him as, as the baseball player who sat and sharpened his spikes so he could run over the second baseman or the shortstop. Uh, and he had those qualities, too. He was very close with his money. Uh, he moved to Cornelia just oh, maybe about a year and a half before he died. Uh, he was uh, oh, Lord, I was a Paul Bear at his funeral. And that was uh, everybody who was a pallbearer except me and a doctor from wine, from uh, Livonia who uh, later had a heart attack and died. And, uh, but everybody else had had a heart attack. So that nobody, Frank, uh, Ty had a crypt. He didn't bury him in the ground up high and up about as high as that table over there. And uh, with just the three of us, the Paul Bear, uh, the, uh, the funeral director, and uh, the doctor, and me. And we tried to lift that casket up to get it up that high. You know, you can just lift with your legs so far. And then the rest of there got to be arm lifting. And we couldn't get Fine. We tried it about three times, and it was hot. It was in August. It was hot. Everybody had taken their coat off. Everybody was in that crib cussing. And, and uh, if I weren't being interviewed, I could tell you what the funeral director said about it, about it but I can't tell you that right now. Uh, we finally got him up there, corner of that casket up on that ledge, and, and we shoved him in and came out exhausted. <laughs> but Ty was, uh, he had a lot of good qualities. For example, he had uh, 21 doctors that he paid their way through, Mercer, through Emory University one of which is an oncologi oncologist in Gainesville right now, and I know him. And uh, 
and Ty paid, paid their way, and he didn't want anybody to know this. And none of the sports writers ever knew this, I don't think. Uh, but Ty was pretty close with his money, and he had a lot of it. Uh, Furman Bisher came to Canada one time. He called me and said, do you know where Ty Cobb lives? I said, yeah. He said, I want to go up there. So he came to see me in the bank, and we went to Mount Airy where Ty lived. And he interviewed, and he interviewed him and took some pictures, and took some pictures of me with Ty sitting on his front porch. And, and uh, about uh, six months later, well, Furman wrote that article and uh, sent it, sold it to the Saturday Evening Post just before they went out of business. And uh, so Ty called him one time, said, what did you get for that? How much did they pay you? He said, they paid me $500. He said, well, you owe me $250 of that. So, so Furman sent him the $250. <laughs> 